you. It is uh, indeed humbling to be asked to, to speak here, let alone to, to share one story. It's like, what can I possibly have to say that would be of, of value to all of you? But um, it is a gift. Um, this past weekend in the gospel, we heard about how the kingdom of God is present in the ordinary stuff of life, in modest mustard shrubs and seeds planted that grow and get harvested. God's presence isn't always as grand or ethereal as we might expect of something called a kingdom. Yet, this is what we're told, that God is present in the ordinary, and if we are to know the kingdom of God, we have to have eyes to see it. Ritually speaking, ordinary stuff like bread and wine becomes the sacramental presence of Christ, but we need eyes to see that. My own life doesn't feel that extraordinary, and yet, in a Eucharistic sense, I know that God has been blessing me with his presence, transforming the ordinary stuff of life into something holy. While I've been invited to share something of my story, I invite you to consider how these dynamics are at work in your own life as well. Can you see the signs of the kingdom among you? Can you see the Eucharist happening in your life? Moreover, can we all see this extraordinary in the ordinary dynamic at work in the life of the church at large? Um, One note to to frame my my talk in a sense, I'm drawing loosely on an approach to young adult ministry shared by Timon Davis of Catholic Theological Union. She calls it my story, your story, our story, and really it's, it's about how do we frame our own stories in light of the story, the Christian story, uh, the bigger story. So, a Eucharistic life. Uh, Let's start with the present. So, since 2003, I've been a Benedictine sister of Monastery Immaculate Conception in Ferdinand, Indiana, which you get to see here. I have the happy job of directing the graduate program at St. Meinrad Seminary and School of Theology here. Um, uh, That's for lay people and deacons, and then I also oversee the non-seminary programs, other, other programs as well. So this place is run by the Benedictine monks of St. Minard Arch Abbey. Mostly I'm an administrator, but occasionally I get to teach and write, usually about icons, church art, monasticism, or Eastern Christianity. I've been given some space to paint icons, and I enjoy singing, and the monks allow me to canter for their monastery mass fairly regularly, and I've become part of a little quartet that uh, is comprised of two monks, an Ursuline sister, and me, which we call brothers and sisters. So, uh, so how did this happen? Uh, this is my community. Um, to understand my life as a Benedictine sister, I think I'm supposed to come back to them. It helps to know something of the larger Benedictine story. St. Benedict lived in Italy from 480 to 547. He founded a number of monasteries and wrote his rule, which has guided monastic life since that time. The core values of his order are embodied in the the vows that monks and sisters take, uh, stability, obedience, and fidelity to the monastic way of life, which also encompasses a lot of other things as well, including uh, some level of simple living and celibacy and uh, many other values as well. We're known for ora et labora, prayer and work, hospitality, and work for peace. Benedictine life is founded, fundamentally geared toward finding God in the everyday. St. Benedict challenges us to see God present in the visitor, in the sick, in the person of the prioress or abbot, in the sister who drives us crazy, and in the daily round of liturgical prayer. As you might guess, some days this is easier than others. In some ways, it's easier to see the effects of this life on those who've lived it for a long time. Back to these ladies. Some of our elder sisters are just radiant. The daily has transformed them, and they almost have this holy glow about them. They're cheerful in the midst of struggles, humorous after a long day of work, and gentle with those who come to them. I hope someday to be a radiant nun, though I know I have a long way to go. (laughs) So my community story, this is all in in a context here. So my community emerges out of this Benedictine order. 
Uh, Benedictine monastery spread, and in 1852, St. Walburg Monastery in Eichstadt, Germany, sent a handful of sisters over to the United States, where they founded a, a monastery in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, in 1852. So within just a couple years, the sisters there, they sent a handful of sisters to Erie, Pennsylvania, where they started a monastery. Within just a couple years after that, they sent sisters to Covington, Kentucky, which is just outside of Cincinnati. And then in 1867, so this is like all of 15 years since the sisters had been in the US, they sent sisters from Covington to Ferdinand, Indiana to found our monastery. So here is uh, Mother Benedicta Burns, who was all of 22 when she was sent to be head of this new community. And, uh, and the, first, the first sisters, they had their first postulant within a week of arriving. Uh, but, I mean, they lived through crazy stuff. They made heroic sacrifices. They rose to the challenge, and somehow they stretched to balance the demands of prayer and work amid really difficult conditions. We hear stories of how to build our monastery church. They, they were skipping meals. They were hauling bricks up the hill after a long day of work, a um, long day of teaching. Many of them died of illnesses in the early years, uh, died young. Uh, no doubt brought on by the hardships of those early years. And, and we owe them such a great debt of gratitude for the beautiful space in which we pray today. Let's see, so that's the beginning of, of the monastery on the hill. Uh, the community grew. Uh, so <laughs> these, these were the sisters attending summer classes in I think it's 1950 something. So, you know, over the years, my community's continued to try to balance monastic prayer with teaching and other forms of ministry, depending on the local needs or the sister power available. In 1962 to 65, we have Vatican II, and during that time, they gave religious communities the call to both return to their roots, uh, the whole concept of ressourcement, and updating practices for today, aggiornamento. So over the past 50 years, my community has really studied the rule and reclaimed some of the monastic terminology and customs that had been lost along the way, while also making adjustments in ministry to serve a wider range of needs. Um, this important work has come a long way, um, and it's still in process, but I would venture to say we have barely scratched the surface. What does it really mean to go back to the roots of the Benedictine tradition? I mean, by the time we were founded in the United States, that was 1852. I mean, Benedict was around the sixth century. Uh, you know, what were we, where was the church of that time? Um, so what does it mean to really, really go back to the roots, to go back to the rule and live it the way St. Benedict invited us to, while also saying, okay, it's, it's 2018. What does that look like today? Um, what, what, is, what is appropriate? What do the next uh, 20 or 30 years hold for my community? Um, frankly, it's a mystery. This, these are some sisters from our bakery doing their thing. Uh, some, some older, some middle-aged, some younger. Um, demographically, if you look at our community, anybody can see that while we have a healthy number of younger sisters, we are, we're pretty outranked by our elders. Uh, and so, you know, it's just going to be a couple years before uh, we're going to be a much smaller community. When they go to God, those of us who follow are going to continue to be community. I mean, we have enough sisters that, that we will continue. Uh, that is not true of every community, but demographically, we've got enough to do it. But it's going to be a lot smaller. And so while St. Benedict was founding monasteries, he was founding monasteries of 12 monks each, 12 different monasteries, 12 monks each. So we know communities can be smaller. We know communities can be bigger. Either way is fine, but the economics and the logistics to support one uh, 150 sisters versus you know 12 sisters or 20 or however many we end up being, um, it's a little different. So it takes a lot of a lot of courage to enter monastic life these days, and but it's, it's also an exciting time if we can begin to dream of okay, if we're going to change, let's change in a way that lets us reclaim the most authentic way of living this life. How can we, how can we get back to our sources in a way that, that are re is really authentic? So I think the point of all this is that, in short, we're part of something so much bigger than ourselves, bigger than our own community, 
Um, Edward von Spybrook notes that in the 1595 uh, Visiones uh, Linium Vitae by Arnoldus, I think this may have been a vision given to St. Gertrude, but I'm not, I'm not actually sure on that. But it's recorded that St. Benedict was promised that his order would continue to the end of the world and that in the final battle between good and evil, the Benedictines would prove, provide important service to the church, confirming many in the faith. And I find that rather comforting. <laughs> uh, you know, we're gonna, you know the, the order will go on. Whether the community goes on forever, well, that's, that's another matter. But the order will go on, um, however true that might be. Um, it does make me wonder, you know, what is, what is our own part in that bigger, that bigger story? What is my, my part in that story? So I'm going to give you a couple glimpses of, of parts of my story, starting with the story of entry into monastic life. So I want to jump back to a, a glimpse from 2001. In 2001, I graduated from a non-Catholic college with a degree in religious studies, which was my academic cover for uh, discerning whether I ought to be a sister. That summer, I spent a marvelous six weeks on this very campus. Uh, we were studying the classics of Christianity. And one day, we were reading the monastic writers. We had Bernard of Clairvaux and William of St. Thierry. And an evangelical guy in the class kind of got a little indignant. And he says, how can anyone like, lock themselves up in a monastery? Didn't Jesus say, go and proclaim to all na nations, um, you know, preaching the faith and all of this? And... Um, I was almost the only Catholic in the class, and uh, I kind of became St. Bernard's lone defender at that moment. And uh, you know, I said, you know, monastic life isn't better or worse, it's just, it's a different way of following the gospel. Um, and so at lunch that day, the campus minister who had been sitting in on our class, he said, well, you know, you were kind of defensive in class this morning, what's that about? I said, defensive? Who's being defensive? <laughs> And I was so surprised by my own reaction. I thought, where in the world did that come from? <laughs> and, and I went back to my bedroom and I started journaling. And, you know, I just started crying because it was like, whoa, this has gotten really personal. It was no longer, I might be a nun or I could be a nun or I'm thinking about being a nun. It was like, I have to do it. I have to. It was just something I knew at that moment. Kind of like Rick talks about Dorothy Day. It's like, I had to do it. This is, this is where we are. Um, so at dinner that evening, uh, I joined my, my friend Landy, and she says, well, how was your day today? And I said, well, I've decided I'm going to be a nun. And she says, congratulations! And she gets up and comes around the other side of the table and gives me a big hug, and everybody's like, what's that about? She says, Gina's going to be a nun! So it was official. <laughs> so that's how, that's how things go. I'd already applied to enter the Jesuit Volunteer Corps that August, to try out living the values of spirituality, community, simple living, and social justice. So I soon found myself in Chicago. Um, I was working at a community center, going to daily mass at Loyola. They got us hooked up with a spiritual director. So I had like the spiritual director for the, the Jesuit novices helping me out. Um, it was really wonderful. In May, the vocation director for my community was in town for a meeting and she said, oh, would you like to go to lunch? So I said, sure, and uh, we went for pizza. And she seemed like a nice lady, but I was surprised she, she started to chide me. And she says, well, why have you been sitting on the fence? You've been on our mailing list for like four years. And I said, well, I haven't been sitting on the fence. And uh, so I've been figuring out what I'm looking for. And she says, what are you looking for? And so it's like, finally, after all this time, I, don't, I guess I'd been discerning for a while, um, you know, I could finally name it. And it was like, I'm looking for good liturgy, and I'm looking for community, and I want the beauty of the tradition, but I want awareness of social justice and praying for the poor. And uh, you know, all of these, these, these pieces of you know, the tradition, but also this openness to where is the Holy Spirit taking the church? And uh, both the sacraments and the social justice. And she just started laughing and she said, oh, you have to come visit Ferdinand. And I thought, okay. So I did finally, and I spent a weekend with the sisters and it was so, wild because up till that point there had just been this drive to keep looking, keep looking. This isn't it yet, you know, the Nashville Dominicans are gorgeous, but I'm not supposed to be one of them. Um, but, you know, at that moment it was like just this deep peace settled down and it was, it was like I could finally be calm and, and know that that drive to keep looking had, uh, had dried up. And so a year later I entered a, as a postulant. Uh, that's first profession, which came later. 
Okay, another glimpse of my story, music. Um, this glimpse started when I was about five. My mother had some notion that we ought to be a musical family, kind of like this. <laughs> so when I was five years old, I started playing the violin, as did my older sister and my brother. Dan somehow was given permission to quit after a year or two but Marisa and I were told that we needed to play violin until we, we were at least 21. <laughs> For me, that directive included, or become an opera singer. <sighs> My younger brother, John, had a short stint of violin, too, before he took on the tuba. And my youngest brother, Edward, somehow missed the violin train and took up clarinet when his time came. In any case, for me, it was play violin until you're 21 or become an opera singer. I didn't question why, or if I did, she didn't give me any particular reason, at least not at that point. Apparently, I was reasonably decent at violin. We had a very good teacher. She was the first chair violin of the Rockford Symphony Orchestra, and she was pretty strict with the Suzuki method, so we listened to our recordings of our songs every day, and we practiced more or less every day. We had private lessons once a week, and then we had group lessons on Saturdays. Um, and with five kids, we might have been a poor family in some other ways, but it didn't feel like it because we had music and life was not boring in our house. I liked the sound of the violin and I liked being able to play it, but by the time I was 10, I was tired of practicing and I was begging to quit. About that time, my family moved to a more rural town um, and we decided about that time that we would shift to the local public school. So. I asked if I could quit violin if I took a band instead, because the, the local school had a band program. And my mother finally agreed. So on my first day of sixth grade in a new school, a new town, I walk into my first day of band class, where the uh, other students are fiddling around with various instruments. And a rather strict looking conductor comes up to me and says, what do you play? And I said, I would like to play clarinet. And she said, well, if I could have a clarinet and be able to play it by like tomorrow, that would be fantastic. Oh goodness, I panicked. Apparently in this school district, the band program starts in fifth grade, not sixth grade. And so by then everybody already had an instrument. They knew something of what to do with it. Uh, so I asked if I could switch to chorus instead. And thus began an unwitting trek toward becoming an opera singer. <laughs> the choir director was a lovable, competent older woman named Dixie Ledeen. We learned to sing in parts and to read music, and I loved it. By high school, I was enrolled in private voice lessons with a stalwart ex-nun named Stella Rankin. She'd trained several professional singers, in her and her basement studio was stacked with Opera Today and various other magazines concerned with voice care. Before long, she had me singing Mozart and Schubert and all the usual lovely fare given to high school sopranos. My mother, the prophet, apparently got her opera singer after all. I don't know what she was thinking as she was hearing arias from my upstairs bedroom, but when I went away to college, apparently the next door neighbor asked my dad, why doesn't your wife sing anymore? <laughs> Who knew I had an audience? College brought more voice lessons with more professional teachers and daily rehearsals with the chamber singers. Those hours singing with that choir were some of the most joyful, transcendent moments of my life. Doc Locke, who is pictured here as we called him, uh, he was our director and he just projected joy at us and we sang it back to him. Um, he was a holy man, he is a holy man, a master teacher who could transform a bunch of sleepy students into radiant participants in something transcendent. Moreover, he exuded love for his wife. He would talk about his wife a lot of times during, during rehearsal. His favorite letter is K, because his wife's name is K. And you know, you can't help but take note of that, you know, as a college student. Um, since entering the monastery, I've sung with several chant scholas led by other such convectors of sacramental beauty. Father Anthony Ruff is one of them, um, and Brother John Mark Falkenhayn. Um, both of them have been such marvelous directors, and to be a singer in one of their scholas is to be leaven made into bread. So let's just see.
All right. So another glimpse of my story is art. A couple years after I entered the monastery, a friend gave me a book for Christmas, Peter Pearson's book, A Brush with God. It was an icon painting workbook that outlined step by step how this could be done. This was the beginning of the flowering of a great gift in my life. During middle school and high school, I'd had a really fantastic art teacher named Pixie Fontesha, who taught me the basics of drawing and painting. And I loved art. Um, I was good at the technical aspects, but I was not creative. Like I had no vision to share with the world and my own personal style. Um, but I could, I could copy well, I could do portraits. I enjoyed that. Um, but here with icons, it was like suddenly the technical copying piece was important, but also so was prayer and spirituality. And now that I was in the monastery, um, this was important. And so it became a vocation within a vocation. Um, I learned as much as I could from books, first using acrylics, and then two years later I took my first workshop with a master Russian iconographer, Senya Pokrovsky. These are some of her icons. Uh, here's Senya. She died in 2013. Um, marvelous master iconographer. Um, she secretly painted icons in Soviet Russia when it was illegal to be an icon painter until she brought her family to the United States in 1995. She was one of a handful of people who saved an ancient tradition that was very near death, and she passed it on to her daughter, Anna Guryev, and my current teacher, Mark Charneski. Um, you know, she's passed away, but she, she left such a legacy that continues, and, and I feel really blessed to be part of it. So this was one of her icons in Goshen, Indiana. Um, I forget what the name of the church is, but the Mystical Supper. Uh, here's Mark, my current teacher, at a workshop a week or two back. And some of his icons there. So uh, I taught high school theology near Louisville for five years. After my final profession of vows in 2010, I was permitted to go back to school for my master's in theology. And I went to St. John's in uh, Minnesota, because I wanted to study monastic studies with Father Columbus Stewart. Um, and there, under his direction, I wrote a master's thesis on icons in the Western Church. And the next thing you know, I was encouraged to submit it for publishing. And the next thing you know, uh, Liturgical Press made a book out of it. And so, you know, my teacher, Mark, proofread everything, and he provided a number of his own icons as illustrations. So from painting icons, I was now called to teach others about them. People would have questions, well, what is this? And why do you do that? And uh, you know, how do we use them? What's the role of images in our church? And how do we use them for worship? How do they help us pray? Um, how do they help us evangelize and catechize? Um, and the summer after I graduated from St. John's, I, I taught a weekend course at St. Meinrad on icons. And it's just kicked off this theme that I never could have dreamed as a kid that I would be able to do all these things that I loved, art and music and theology, all in, the same, all in the same life. I continue to learn as a student of the icon, and even as I teach, I continue to work with a teacher. It's uh, profoundly humbling to discover one's limits and to know that this is a tradition so broad and deep that I could give my whole lifetime to it and still not become a master. It's not about my own vision, but being faithful to passing on the vision the teaching of the church, a vision of the world transformed by God's love, where everything has been set right. My icon teacher says the three questions that he gets the most when he talks about icons are these. Number one, why are icons so ugly? Two, why are they so grumpy? And three, why are icons so dark? These are the things we must continue to work to counteract in our own painting. They aren't supposed to be dark or ugly or grumpy, but the truth is, there's a lot of bad iconography out there. So, uh, so here are a couple, a couple views of things I've worked on. Uh, Michael and Gabriel and David and Extreme Humility, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, and Anthony and Samuel and Nicholas and Paul and Elijah and Michael again. This was two weeks ago, he's getting oiled. And then Jesus is not quite done yet, but he's, he's in process. So, <laughs> <laughs> if 
but you know, it's, it's really wonderful. It's really wonderful. You know, when you're painting an icon of Jesus or a saint, one is working in prayer and silence with such earthy stuff, wood and chalk dust and marble dust and rabbit skin glue and honey and oil and crushed earth pigments, egg yolks. Um, board preparation involves layers and layers of spackling gesso. Then after the drawing, the painting begins starting out with the deepest colors and then layer by layer, prayer by prayer, gradually moving toward the light. Usually about the time one gets toward finishing the eyes, there's this, there's this wonderful moment when the holy person shows up. It's this marvelous mystery, frankly, that while I can be doing all this work for hours and hours and days or however long it takes, with my own hands, suddenly this holy person is present and I'm no longer alone in the studio. Where did you come from, I have to ask? you know, It's just kind of like, who are you? Like, What are you doing here? Um, and yet, I've been working on it the whole time. I imagine mothers and fathers may experience something akin to this at the birth of their children. It's a holy Eucharistic moment. How did God do this through my hands? I pray that my life might be worthy of facilitating such mysteries. So our story, the story. This brings us to a place to step back to the wider view of the Christian story, the story. It's my story, your story, our story. So let's just recap how this is a love story. For God so loved the world. So God wanted us to have eternal life together with him in heaven forever. But humanity sins, and despite ourselves, too often we tend to choose death rather than life, the lie rather than the truth. So God sent Jesus to transform all our evil into something good. He taught us how to love. He healed people. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, the possibility of repentance, the little moves toward life that we might choose in the ordinary. He gave us his body and his blood. Ultimately, he allowed evil to be done unto him. He died and was raised up in order that we might also be raised up with him. He ascended into heaven and sent us the Holy Spirit that his life might continue among us in the flowering of all the charisms meant for the building up of the church. His ultimate purpose is to draw us all to himself so that he might become all in all. This is the Christian story, that God became human in order that humans might become God. Irenaeus and Athanasius summed it up well. So the crux of it. Where does my story meet your story, our story, the story? What is my little part in the bigger picture? Perhaps it is impossible to state the value of one's own life while still living it on earth, but from the glimpses I've shared, here's what I can see. Praising God with gorgeous music is a joyful foretaste of heaven. God wants us to long for heaven, and it is a joy to share in that, at least the days that our chant is on key. To be an instrument expressing God's own beauty is a gift. While it may be fun for me, it's meant for the church. So thinking about your own life, what in your life brings you joy, but is really meant as a gift for the church? Creating beauty through the icon is about sharing the vision of truth and wholeness to which God invites us. It is both a joy and a responsibility to facilitate this kind of incarnational expression Again, while it may be fun for me, it's meant for the church. In your life, how do you facilitate a clearer communication of the gospel? Teaching others knowledge of the faith is to give an invitation to go deeper into the mystery of God, to partake more fully in the life of God. It's a joy to teach theology. While I love learning, this too is meant for the church. How do we break open the bread we have been given and share it with a hungry world? Serving the needy can take different forms. While some are more likely to be found serving those in the gutters, for a Benedictine, tending the elderly members of my own community is itself a way of serving Christ. So is providing hospitality to visitors. So is being patient with another sister's weaknesses as she grows in the way of life. It's a joy to be able to see and serve Christ in them. God help me to see Christ in them. 
But as you think about your own life, who is the needy face of Christ you are called to serve? How can you become the bread that they need? Where will we be in Jesus' final plan? The particulars of that are not clear, but I know that what I do today matters. You and I are stewards of a rich tradition. It may be that we too might become just part of a handful of people passing on these ancient remnants of something good, making them fresh in the light of a new time. We have to remember that if all time is present to God, the past and the present are also part of the future. My present recapitulates elements of my past. Violin taught me ear training, which made me a better singer, which made me an instrument for God's beauty. Drawing lessons and a practice of prayer became ingredients for icon painting, which led to study. Study led to fodder for writing and teaching. Showing up to community events became the practice field for becoming more patient, more loving, more kind. Each moment of formation is a moment of transformation, a moment of transubstantiation, a moment of theosis, becoming God bit by bit. From a more mathematical view, we can say that like a fractal, everything is present in each microscopic detail, even as it is also the macroscopic pattern of the universe. Christ is the pattern. Our lives, in as much as they are being transformed into his, are part of the pattern. We may have a hard time seeing it, getting caught up in the daily stuff of life, but the daily is where God is. A Eucharistic life is a life where the daily gifts and joys and struggles we encounter allow us to become bread broken and shared for the binding up of the world into one. My gift might be music or art or teaching theology or being patient behind slow nuns. Yours might be healing or pastoral accompaniment or motivating people to work for more just laws or not killing screaming children. While some gifts might be more plainly seen or heard, they all matter. How can we proclaim the gospel with our lives? How can we embody the presence of Christ? As bread and wine do not resist being changed into Eucharist, let us not stand in God's way. The end. So I'll let Tim call the shots. Yes. So uh, once again, an opportunity to ask questions or to react. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, I, go, I go to a lot of academic conferences, but I don't normally enjoy late afternoon sessions as much as this. Uh, maybe it's getting uh, entered in someone's life and, and uh, the generosity of allowing to do that. So thank you both for that. Uh, but maybe there might be some questions or some thoughts uh, that arise from what, what I Sister, it's good to see a fellow Benedictine here. I'm from Subiaco. Well, Our well. history goes back to 1878, both of us. Mm-hmm. We started in Arkansas in March of 1878. By October of that same year, your sisters were there. Mm-hmm. We sent sisters and within a couple together years of our ever, founding. Yeah. We've been together ever since. Yeah. And I thought you'd like to know, they're, oh, they're dedicating their new mother house in October. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering, how many other communities has your sisters founded? We founded a house in Belcourt, North Dakota, uh, Beach Grove, Indiana, yours in, in Fort Smith. Uh, we founded a house in Peru. We worked with other communities to found one in uh, Colombia, which is now under different management. Peru is still a dependent monastery of us, but the others uh, have gone on. Uh, Belcourt has since closed. Uh, those sisters came back to us. Beach Grove is probably the other single largest community uh, in the U.S. with with a number of younger sisters, uh, Benedictines these days. Um, 
Am I forgetting anybody? I think five or six at least. Yeah. You know, yeah. as you well know, we take a vow of stability. Mm -hmm. But I've seen more of the world since I've been in the monastery. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They say, join the monastery, see the world. <laughs> I hope that I can say this coherently. Uh, I'm a parent, and I'm just grateful to your superiors who have seen this and allowed you the freedom to do this. And I, we all laughed when they showed the, you showed the picture of 100 nuns, but um, it's just, it's part of being a religious is, is seeing your gifts, doing it, and it, one thing leads to another. As our children grow up, we see, mm -hmm. oh, my, I have the pleasure of having one of my children join the Carmelites. And uh, how would I have known when right. she was six that what she learned on the farm was helping her later in life? It, it, having someone who is in charge of you, who can guide you. And a lot of us have our own uh, hobbies and things that we strike a balance with the work that we do with the church. and. When are we being selfish with our hobbies and when are we giving it back? I think that's a lot of things I struggle with is, uh -huh. you know, sometimes you have to step back and right. do what you do just to feed your head a little bit, you know, uh, either with learning a skill that you're interested in and later can apply to the church mm -hmm. every time, every time. Yeah, it's a discernment what between what is just a fun hobby that gives right. me strength so I can do my real work versus... Right. Oh, who knew this hobby was going to be part of the service that I do? But as lay people, we don't have someone who's kind of overseeing that. So yeah. we can't be obedient. And ob when your superior said, go learn, I can I she, she didn't say it. I found it on my own. But they've well, given me permission to do it. Which, she gave you permission it, to do yeah, it. Yeah. So do I yeah. ask my husband? <laughs> <laughs> can't hurt. But you do whatever you want. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'm like really comfortable with silence. Not a real question, but um, um, you're part of a quartet that we beautifully heard. Is that at St. Monterey's? Mm -hmm. And we, uh, so do you, um, on a regular basis, serve the liturgy? Yes, that recording was from during communion. Yeah. Yeah, and, usually uh, I was wondering once every couple weeks. With regard to all that you've said, with regard to your personal journey, um, how would you maybe even flourish it a little bit more with regard to how you experience liturgy? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, because you're participating uh, in, a, in a level that all of your gifts coalesce to the present, mm -hmm. which have a rich history. Mm -hmm. and, but you're also involved in the Paschal mystery, the celebration of the Paschal Mystery. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of wondering uh, how this has deepened your appreciation of that mystery. I think uh, a lot of my own work with icons and, and what went into the book was actually um, Dennis McNamara's talk uh, kind of captured some of it, but a lot of my work builds on his. And some of it is appreciation of how the worship space is itself part of the ritual and part of the experience of the liturgy. And so liturgical images should be making visible the invisible dimensions of what's going on. Um, but I think as, as our other talk this morning is talking about, the musical dimension is also 
making present and making more obvious some of the invisible dimensions. Um, and so I think I've become more aware of how is my own ability to embody what's going on here, making visible or making more auditory um, the experience of the truth of what we're talking about when we do, when we do liturgy. Um, I'm definitely more attentive to, to liturgical spaces and then and the kinds of music that we sing. Uh, occasionally I get these wonderful opportunities to sing great music and, and it's lovely and ethereal and transcendent and, and, and kind of like you said this morning, um, sometimes you don't know the effect on other people. Yes, people will come up afterwards, oh, that was so wonderful, whatever. You know, it's great, it's beautiful. Uh, you, know, you offer your gift and you don't know what happens and that's, that's God's business to figure out how it touches someone else's heart. Um, and, and to be honest, a lot of times my own awareness is probably not as, as acute as you might think. I loved Rick's talk because his, his sense of um, awareness and, and feeling it was, is so obvious and, and strong. Benedictines, we tend to go through the motions and eventually it shapes us. We may or may not feel anything while we do it, uh, but eventually one day you wake up and you're different. Um, so I think that that's, <laughs> that's part of my experience too. And, and the reality of daily liturgy and prayer at my own house uh, is not always glorious. It is not. Um, but we show up and we're there and something happens in that every day. And you pray the Psalms and whether you're on key or nobody can hear what's going on or it, it's okay. You know, it, I, I, I might have very high personal standards of what, we, what we're aiming for. We may or may not get there, but, but you show up anyway. And God has to take that and do with that uh, whatever it's worth, you know. Um, so I think that's been my experience of, of deepening in the experience of liturgy, that, that you show up and you do what you can, and sometimes what you can is really great, and sometimes what you can doesn't make a difference. But... Oh well, <laughs> you know, uh, and hopefully there's a gift in that too.